David, mm -hmm. who tends to man the grill at your house, you or the one? Oh, very interesting choice of words there, Renee, man the grill. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think that's rather instructive, and I think that's actually kind of the point. Neither of us man the grill, and neither of us don't man the grill. It's We have this love-hate relationship with our grill. We, hmm. we don't fully feel we know how to grill perfectly, but we feel that we don't want to be inside in the summer, so we muddle our way through the grill. Maybe that's the best way, not man, but muddle. What could possibly go wrong? You love steak. I know the big, bloody, rare, barely mooing <laughs> steaks. Are you a big griller? Get back here. It's dinner time. You know, you have to remember, I spent 20 years in tiny apartments on the East Coast. So I had all this pent up grilling, mm -hmm. you know, need in me right. when I moved out to Phoenix. I did actually try grilling once on my fire escape in Washington, D.C., and found out why there is a fire ordinance against doing that six feet from the building. <laughs> please tell me you weren't on the seventh floor and people of the third floor discovered that you were grilling, please. It didn't tip over, did it? I handled it. Oh. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> I handled it. A shower of dinner and sparks <laughs> and hot coals. Anyway, so <laughs> since moving back home to Phoenix, I have uh, begun to get my grilling legs underneath me. But like mm -hmm. you, I've muddled through a lot, right? Steaks, yeah. I'm getting there. Chicken, I'm pretty good with. Fish, I'm working on. Oh, boy. Yeah. It's yeah. just, it's hard. What about you, Adam? Are you a big griller, smoker kind of man? <laughs> well, I don't, I'm not a smoker. I wish. I love smoked mm -hmm. meats. I do love to grill. But I mean, big griller? Probably not. But I'll eat anything grilled. Serve it up. Yeah. Nice. Do you have any big challenges when it comes to man versus fire for you? Yeah, I guess probably what I'd say is really the same as Renee. It's fish. It's always been kind of a big question mark for me. How long to cook it and, you know, make it so it's not all burnt and nasty on the outside. Mm, yeah, that's true. And another challenge for me is really trying to find the right wardrobe for grilling you know, what would make me look best for grilling. So that's always, you know, that's always, mm -hmm. we plan that months in advance before the whole grilling season starts. Anyways, it's a good thing we have a guest here. We're not going to talk about fashion for At The Grill, but we are going to talk about challenges at The Grill. I think fashion is a very big challenge for a lot of people, Renee. Hey, I love my Vogue and I love my heels, but there's a time and a place for everything. Oh, I'm David Leet, the founder of the website Leet School in Oreo. And I'm Renee Shetler, the site's editor in chief. And this is the non fashion version of talking <laughs> with my mouth full. And it's a good thing for Adam and me, and also Renee, when it comes to fish for you, that we have our very own St. John of Arc when it comes to the grill here to save us from the mortal sin of ruining a great piece of meat or protein with fire. Matt Moore is a Nashville musician, a chef, a pilot, an entrepreneur, Southern gentleman, and author of three cookbooks, his latest being, I love this title, Serial Griller. Welcome to the show, Matt. Matt, welcome. Hey guys, thanks so much for having me. We're glad you're here. For your most recent book, Matt, you traveled across the 12 states that make up the barbecue belt to interview various chefs. Can you tell us about the sort of people you chose to seek out so you could learn their secrets? Yeah, you know, for me, it's always kind of been a, a bit of an inexact science. So um, as you mentioned in, in the last book is actually where we traveled the, the, the barbecue belt. It was called the South's Best Butts. And I always mm -hmm. tell people that uh, it's not a calendar. We did the 12 states that make up the barbecue <laughs> belt. But um, for Cereal Griller, we actually kind of expanded the horizon. Um, you know, being a Southerner, obviously grilling is something that permeates um, really every society around the world. And, you know, I'm a big believer in diversity and the fact that um, we could solve a lot of problems if everybody could sit across each other from a dinner table. And the cool thing is that in nearly every culture and cuisine across the world, uh, cooking over a live fire is is something that everybody practices. So it allowed me to kind of broaden the map. Uh, we actually ended up traveling about 10,000 miles for Cereal Griller, as I like to say, uh, wow. hun hunting down some of the best grill masters across the country. So some are well known, like um, you know Michael Solomonoff up at Zahav in Philadelphia, and Ashley Christensen and Raleigh from Death and Taxes, who have uh, been fortunate to win the the last two years of James Beard Outstanding Chef. But at the same time, we also wanted to pay homage to uh, experts like Meathead out of Chicago, up-and-comers like Margie's Grill in New Orleans, and then just a big cast of characters like Jerry Baird out of Texas or Cadillac out of Atlanta. So certainly a journey to try to capture as much as we could on the road. 
in the book, there's this incredible influence from the Middle East, and you have souvlaki in there, octopus souvlaki. Talk about some of those influences that are influencing your work and what you pursued when you were looking for people to cover in the book. Yeah, you know, for me, as I mentioned, um, the fact that we're so blessed to live in a country where everybody comes from somewhere else, we bring our cultures and our traditions here and our food is very much celebrated. So, you know, for me and my family, my mom, um, my grandparents are, are from Syria and Lebanon. So we grew up with a lot of that Middle Eastern influence. And, uh, Interesting. you know, I've always been interested in that that flavor of a lot of garlic, a lot of vinegar, a lot of citrus, uh, olive oils and, and charcoal. Mm. And so um, what you mentioned, David, uh, the souvlakis, we picked that up at a place called Greco, which is just about a mile from my house here in Nashville. And um, I live in East Nashville, so a really diverse part of town. Um, and, and that restaurant particularly, we, we grew up kind of with uh, kind of Chicago style Euro places here where they're using mm-hmm. that very cheap kind of frozen cone where people go in and it's more about being fed um, a hearty meal very cheaply. Whereas these guys came from Athens, Greece, and they wanted to pick up on Athenian style Greek food. So they're really cooking from scratch and, and producing all of this over a large uh, charcoal fire. And of course you pick up um, from Zahav with uh, Michael Solomonoff. He's got the influence from, from Israeli food it, it's obviously, uh, I think, some of the most exciting food that we find in the country. And he is, uh, as we've already mentioned, you know, one of the best chefs here in America. And his restaurant is very difficult to get a table at. Uh, but I got a table because American Airlines kept canceling my flights through Philly. So I would just go to the bar by myself <laughs> and eat. And, um, nice. and that's truly how we struck up a friendship. You know, it's um, kind of a brotherhood of, um, I guess, coming from the Middle East and, uh, and sharing cuisines. And I talked to him about how he made his kibbe naya which I told him reminded me of my grandmother, and I think we became fast friends. Ah, cool. That'd Very do it. Cool. So narrowing the world of grilling down to Southern grilling. Sure. Matt, I've heard you say that it basically comes down to three components. It's about the pork, it's about the low and slow, and it's about the wood and the smoke. Can you talk us briefly through each of those components? Yeah, and I, and I think that would probably revisit again um, probably the idea more of barbecue versus grilling. So as a Southerner, Mm -hmm. we know we really define the two as as disparate subjects, right? So barbecue to me is something that is uh, primarily very low, very slow. Um, And Southern barbecue, we really um, eloquate that to pork. Obviously, as you make your way westward towards Texas and Oklahoma, you begin to pick up more influences when it comes to beef. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, the idea of barbecue, true Southern barbecue, most Southerners in the Deep South will tell you it's got to be pork. It's got to be cooked uh, indirectly for long periods of time. And that's kind of the last book was where we focused on the pork shoulder or what we call the pork butt of really taking a very cheap cut of meat and using time and temperature and wood to equal results. And in the new book, Serial Griller, we really wanted to shift that narrative to say, how do we make everything great over a live fire and cook everything very hot and fast? Um, scientifically, there's actually a method for that. It's known as the Maillard reaction, uh, mm-hmm. where all good things mm-hmm. happen above 300 degrees. And in the last <laughs> book, you know, I had a, a great pit master told me that nothing good in barbecue happens above 300 degrees, whereas everything great in grilling happens above that temperature because you get that natural um, brown food is good food reaction of the natural enzymes and sugars. So in Cereal Griller, we're really trying to set up a stage where uh, at every moment throughout the process, we're allowing that Maillard reaction to occur so that we get that Mm -hmm. beautiful char, um, that aroma, that umami flavor that's so significant when it comes to grilling. So two disparate subjects, in my opinion, that a lot of people probably confuse, especially my wife, who's from Wisconsin, who invited me to a um, a barbecue one time uh, at her home um, outside of Milwaukee. And uh, I showed up expecting pulled pork sandwiches and baked beans and coleslaw, and <laughs> there was uh, bratwurst and Miller Lite and cheese plates, which is great, but it was not barbecue. <laughs> yeah, definitely <exactly>. not. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> Very good distinction. So when it comes to grilling, what are the three foods that people really gravitate to mostly? Yeah, I mean, Americans have their classics. So the the burger Mm -hmm. is just a classic grilled item. Um, Mm -hmm. I think one of the most popular techniques 
that has really caught fire, I guess, if we're going to play a, a, a pun on words here. Yeah, uh, okay. In the book, we actually went and visited a place um, outside of Athens, Georgia, which is my alma mater, so go dogs, called The Grill in Athens, Georgia. And mm-hmm. they, in fact, do not cook over a live fire. They cook on a, on a flat top, a, a griddle. Mm. And I did that on purpose because I knew I would catch some critical um, folks that might say, hey, it's not true grilling if it's not over a fire. But I, I actually believe you cook the best burger on a, on a flat top. So the way that we overcome that on a, on a standard grill is just utilizing a cast iron pan, whether you have a gas grill, if you have a charcoal nice. grill, uh, mm-hmm. even if you don't have a grill. I know a lot of folks have been stuck at home and not been able to, uh, to get outside or just their homeowners associations don't allow it. You can still get a great sear on the outside of the burger over the stovetop and finish it off in a warmed oven. So it allows it to get a a beautiful sear, as I mentioned earlier, and it also allows it to cook up in its own juices. And uh, I think that's one of those classics that a lot of people can solve the hockey puck syndrome or the flare-ups that they get from a traditional gas or charcoal grill simply Mm -hmm. by putting a $20 lodge cast iron skillet right on top of the grates. Um, I think at the same time, you know, we, we hear a lot about steaks. Um, that's just quintessential grilled American food. Um, I spent sure. some time with Meathead out of uh, Chicago. Yeah, who is, uh, that's Meathead. great. <laughs> you got to love Meathead. Oh, man. He is uh, honestly one of my favorite people ever, and I have so yeah. much respect for him. And um, we argue a lot, but he always wins. But at the end of the day, <laughs> when you taste his food, you know why. <laughs> So he really was yeah. a yeah. Um, he was a pioneer of kind of the reverse sear, as he calls it, the redneck sous vide of indirect mm-hmm. cooking, low and slow um, on a, on a smoker or a charcoal grill or even a gas grill, and then of course letting that Maillard reaction happen. So steaks, we give you a lot of different recipes when it comes to that. But I think what I'm most proud of is beyond those classics, we spend a lot of time on a lot of alternatives. So uh, yeah. my kids, you know, I, I've got a, a five year old and a three year old. And uh, they would not eat a Brussels sprout that I would roast in the oven, but they'll eat one if I pull it off of a grill. Um, you know, so a lot of grilled vegetables, a lot of grilled salads, a lot of grilled fruits and desserts. So the idea behind Cereal Griller, besides being just a funny title that I think is uh, eye-catching and something you remember, is the idea that no matter the course, no matter the meal, we can make things better over fire. And, and then that's really uh, something that parlays into a lot of different cuisines and dietary mm-hmm. lifestyles, whether you're a vegetarian or vegan, uh, or if you're you know, a pure burger and steak and chicken person, there's a lot to pull from when it comes to uh, accessing the, the, the power of the grill, if you will. Well, that's one of the things that I was really impressed about with the book is that you go from nibbles to apps to main courses, sides, and also desserts. And of course, nobody thinks desserts. And whenever we grill, and by the way, I this is I said this earlier to Adam and to Renee, I am not a very good griller. I think I am constitutionally unable to grill well. I think I just, <laughs> I, I think I'm missing a gene or some people may say enough testosterone to be able to really work a grill properly. But whenever we do that, we always bake dessert in the house and then bring it out. Now, talk to us a bit about using the grill as an oven, because I've seen some of the great stuff that you do, and I think people have a disconnect in their head. Men will grill, women will go in and bake something, and I don't think it has to be that way. No, I mean, first things first, just pause one second. You ready? This is what you're missing, David. You ready? Yeah. Here we go. Did you hear that? Yeah, I certainly did. What is that? I I don't know. (laughs) That was a pop of a cold beverage. Ah, okay. (laughs) That's all I'm missing is a pop of a cold beverage. I'll be a great griller. You need to relax a little, David. You know, David, like for me, my mom, um, mama, as I I call her, you know, being Mm -hmm. a Southern boy, you know, she is uh, the one that taught me really everything about cooking. But uh, my mom can work a grill just as well as my father can as well. That's and great. I think in all my books, including barbecue and, and grilling, it's really important for me to showcase um, an equal split um, because I mm-hmm. don't think it's I don't think it's primarily a, a masculine thing to grill. In fact, I think it's uh, I've seen a, a lot of fantastic women uh, pull off some amazing feats that men would be lucky to pull off. And in fact, the entire team that shot the photography and did the food styling was all a female team. And that was done on purpose. Yes, so we know I many of them. Yeah, so they did a- Helene Dujardin, <laughs> yeah. one of our Helene is our awesome, colleagues. absolutely. So, you know, I think when you talk about baking, um, mm-hmm. we, we spend some time in the book talking, and, and this is a great um, topic that Meathead and I actually do agree on, on the different forms of heat. So you, you have radiant heat, which is often mm-hmm. referred to as uh, as direct grilling. You have indirect heat, which is uh, 
you know, convection style grilling. And then you also have conductive heat, uh, which is coming off of just the, the metal or the grates. And so uh, I think I go through an analogy, you know, if I was hanging out in Savannah on a hot summer day and I was standing right under the sun, that's an idea of, of radiant heat or direct grilling. So to cool off, I'll move to the shade. Uh, and mm-hmm. if you've ever been in Savannah during the summer, it, it provides a little bit of relief from that direct sun that's beaming down on you, but you're in the shade and you're getting that convective activity also with some humidity that we try to avoid in grilling, but it's still mm-hmm. hot. And so that's the idea of kind of baking. And if I were to go back out and sit on a, um, a black metal bench that was sitting there uh, in one of the corners, if you're imagining Forrest Gump right now, then I would most likely burn a <laughs> hole through my pants because that's that uh, <laughs> conductive heat that you're picking up just from the grill grates. So in mm-hmm. baking on a grill, the idea is that we're using indirect heat and we're closing the grill because we want to trap mm-hmm. the heat in the exact same way that you would an oven. And then when mm-hmm. we talk more direct heat, that's more kind of like cooking directly over your stovetop. And then the conductive heat is the whole idea of preheating your pans on the stovetop so that you allow that metal or cast iron to do the work that's necessary when it comes to uh, picking up that char. I love that. You keep the heat in the grill, not in the kitchen <laughs> by firing up the oven. Absolutely. What are some of your favorite desserts, grilling desserts? I, I actually think probably one of the most underrated desserts um, are fruits. Um, I agree. With all the natural mm-hmm. sugar and fruit, you allow that Maillard reaction to occur. Um, so we have quite a bit. We have figs, we have watermelon, we have peaches, uh, apples, mm. pineapple, and, um, Wait, you put watermelon on the grill? Oh, it's unbelievable, yes. So just a, mm. a really hot heat is what, what it needs and direct mm-hmm. heat and that can, can conductive heat as well. So watermelon on the grill is a fantastic dessert as we do kind of finishing it with some pistachio and some uh, crystallized ginger and orange zest and a little bit of Greek yogurt. It's just a showstopper. It's really fresh. Uh, but at the same Absolutely time- Absolutely brilliant. Yeah, you could still do it as a salad, right? So you, you have a grilled watermelon where you, the idea is not, not to grill it too long just to get that char and that reaction to where you kind of get a little bit of warmth that's contrasted with the coolness. Uh, I was just at some friends today at the pool um, and we did literally, I put some watermelon on the grill with some really nice feta cheese and some fresh mint from the garden and a really nice drizzle of um, aged balsamic vinegar. And, you know, it's just taking kind of a salad that people are, are I think, more common to kind of a watermelon, salty feta salad, but you put it mm-hmm. on the grill and it just picks up that smoke and char. It's a no brainer. And then, you know, again, talking about the South, like, Peach cobbler is my nemesis. You know, I love it, but I can't eat it every day. So the way I pull that off is I I just put some (laughs) peaches on the grill, maybe a sprinkle of brown sugar or honey, and serve that with uh, vanilla ice cream or a vanilla Greek yogurt. That's just a fantastic Mm. finish to uh, a great meal. Sounds superb to me. Yeah, that's one of the things I do do well, I think, on the grill, is I do use the cast iron skillet a lot. Sure. For vegetables and for for fruit, I will use that. I'm better with that than actually right on the grill. Matt, I got to ask, when you're at other people's backyard barbecues, like you mentioned earlier today, are you the one always assigned to the grill? Do you ever get a break? (laughs) Um, I'm glad my wife's not here because she would tell you that I'm always put in charge. You know, we we have Mm -hmm. uh, a great community here in Nashville and, and most of the time... Uh, if something's going on, I'll, I'll usually get pulled into the cooking, which she's like, that means you're not hanging out with me. You're just cooking. Um, mm-hmm. But at the same time, we live in a pretty big fu- foodie community. So I, I actually try to step back and I, I always tell people I'm not a food critic, right? I have such this cool job that I get sure. to canvas the country, write cookbooks, tell my stories. Mm-hmm. And uh, I've really never met a meal that I didn't like. I mean, I'm, I'm just somebody that kind of likes everything. Um, So I'm not there to kind of judge things. I think it's just cool to learn from people and tell their stories. And especially with the last two books, I've been responsible for sort of being the the conductor. Um, You know, we fly my little small plane all around these places. And my hope is that you're sitting in the right seat in the plane, hopefully not on a bumpy, windy day. But um, you come along with us, you pick up the journey, you see these beautiful photos, you catch these kind of slice of life stories of um, these incredible people that are carrying on their own family and food traditions uh, and it's just my job to kind of um, do them the justice and, uh, and also uh, be accountable for the responsibility to tell their stories and showcase their recipes. So uh, I do often bow out. If folks are, are wanting to cook, then by all means, my goal is to get more, more people cooking and sharing food. So uh, that's a good mm-hmm. thing. Beautiful. And you do, as you've mentioned, fly from place to place in your own plane. It's a piper. Is that correct? Yeah, I've got a, um, a Piper Cherokee, a, a little PA-28. It's nothing fancy. I call it a lawnmower in the sky, but it, it serves me well. <laughs> it and there's a great done. photograph of you there 
piloting this plane with a pulled pork sandwich <laughs> just about going into your mouth. Can you talk about what you were doing with that pulled pork sandwich and why it was important for you to be eating it up, I don't know, 20,000 feet in the air, whatever you fly? Uh, well, I can't get to 20. I'd need supplemental <laughs> oxygen. But um, there's <laughs> okay. actually really a funny story about that. I, um, my photographer, Andrea Behrens, who shot the last two books, uh, she's such an incredible photographer and I basically have to convince her to hang out with me even though I'm probably the weirdest person she's ever met for three <laughs> months of her life. But um, on that particular day, you know, she was like, you want this photo of you eating a sandwich in a, in a plane? This has nothing to do with a cookbook. But I kind of told her that there's a theme to all my books. They always have aviation related photos. And mm -hmm. um, I'll never forget because um, we, were, we were at about 7,500 7, feet um, coming in from Memphis back into Nashville, and we were kind of staging this thing, not necessarily the safest thing to do uh, while flying an airplane. Of her. Yes. <laughs> Listeners, do not try this at home. Please do not fly your plane while eating. Because we don't have autopilot, and I'm like, just get one picture of me. And right then, uh, air traffic control came on, and they said, Cherokee, 90511 kilo. And essentially they made a call that there was an Army helicopter below me and they were uh -oh. unable to make radio contact with the helicopter because they were below the, um, essentially, um, you still utilize radio communications in aviation. And so if you're below a certain altitude, it's hard for them to reach. So he was asking me to give air to air to the army. And this is right as I'm like chomping in a second. So I'm like, uh, you're like, let me finish my barbecue <laughs> like, sandwich. Excuse me, ATC, can you come back? And they're like, can you make a radio call? And like, normally you're supposed to do everything correctly, but I was like, hold on a second. So I have to like ask again <laughs> because I got to get the sandwich out of the way. I got to write down the code. So then I'm like, Army, you know, blah, 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 Cherokee, please contact, you know, Memphis approach on 122.9 or 7. So they contacted him and then we took the photo, but it was just like worst timing ever. I think like flying in five years, I've never had to contact the Army except for the time that I had a barbecue sandwich in my mouth. In your <laughs> mouth. Makes a great story though. Yeah, it It does. Not a lot of people have that. Matt, so the most popular smoked meat recipe on our site by far, right? Smoked pork butt. Sure. Mm. Probably not a surprise to you, <laughs> but can you talk us through what people need to know to make a pork butt that's so spectacular? You can literally slide the bone right out yeah. without any effort whatsoever, and the meat just falls apart. Which we have seen you do on television, <laughs> so we know you know how to do it. Yeah, I mean, you know, um, in the barbecue band of brothers, uh, mm -hmm. I often joke around that ribs are like the lead singer of the band. Uh, everybody loves them, uh, but at the same time, they're quite mm -hmm. finicky. You know, they're kind of flaky. I think um, lately the brisket has kind of been like the um, the lead guitarist. You know, it's it's captured more attention. They're trying to steal mm -hmm. the spotlight. But I always say that the pork butt, which is the pork shoulder, there's a, a mm -hmm. bit of a, a misnomer right. there. It's kind of like the drummer. They keep everybody in time. It's super humble. And, and really the pork butt is, is probably the most versatile cut that, uh, that you can find. So in, in my book, The South's Best Butts, we traveled, uh, again, all 12 states of the barbecue belt, focusing on uh, each pit master from the state and, and how they represented uh, the butt. You know, it's kind of like the old mm -hmm. joke was, how is your butt? Um, and, and one common denominator that you mentioned earlier, David, is that you know, uh, time and temperature will equal results, right? So you've got this mm -hmm. massive eight to 12 pound hunk of shoulder meat and the way people approach it is actually quite different. So burn company out of Tulsa, Oklahoma will quarter it um, to create more surface area. And they will actually kind of grill it, as I would say. They would cook it above 300 degrees and then they would wrap it in foil and then move it to indirect heat for four to six hours because they've mm. kind of quartered it down. That's probably the mm -hmm. fastest that I ever saw a pork butt cooked uh, as we were writing that book. Whereas you go to uh, like uh, Skip Steel, up at Bogart Smokehouse in St. Louis, and he is literally cooking those butts at 200 degrees for 20 hours. Mm -hmm. Yeah, The same result is what you're looking for, is for that bone to pull just super clean from the meat. I mean, yeah. literally where to it's, it's just nothing touches that bone. It comes out super evenly, and there's different ways to get there. Um, but most would agree that no matter if you if you cut up the butt, <laughs> if you cook it, you know, two seventy five for twelve hours or two hundred for for twenty hours, they all have different methods. But the idea is that you want to get that butt to an internal temperature uh, mm -hmm. of about two hundred degrees, and and you want to do it low and slow because there's a lot of fat and cartilage that needs to be broken down through the cooking process. So um, that was really a, a unique piece, and I, I also think that the diversity of what you can do 
with that meat, whether it's uh, you know barbecue spaghetti or like a, a Cuban banh mi or whatever the the the, the yield comes Absolutely. from that pork, is it really mm-hmm. produces um, a rich array of recipes that's worth celebrating. And that's what I love about your work and your cooking is it blurs a lot of lines. Talking about banh mi and other things you can do with this, where some pit masters are just strictly what they do, which is terrific. I love the fact that there's this I don't know, this ecumenical aspect to how you look at at what you do. And you mentioned ribs. This is a, a question I had. Do you know B.E. Scott out in Tennessee? I, I don't, actually. I, I was thinking you were going to say Rodney Scott at, at, the, at the first, but um, I, I'm not familiar with B.E. Okay, it was Ricky Parker who has passed, and I was there for about maybe 10 days. I worked with him, and there was whole hog... Whole, it was whole hog. Well, I can't say this. That's okay. I'm from the no- I'm from the north, so we say whole hog. <laughs> it, it was whole hog barbecue, and I remember these things were the size of businessmen, and you'd flip them onto the, onto the grill, and it was very low and slow for a very long time. And one of the things they did was they took the ribs and they would flip them out, and then when they flipped out completely clean, they knew that they were done. Yep. Yet we have been so excoriated online because we have a recipe called fall off the bone ribs. <laughs> mm-hmm. And we have some people saying that is not what ribs are supposed to be. The meat is supposed to cling to the rib. You're supposed to gnaw it off the bone, if you will. Yep. Chew it off the bone. <laughs> Where do you stand on that? Oh, man, I love this. This is fun. Thank you, guys. <laughs> um, again, I love my wife. We uh, we hang out all the time, but she's from Wisconsin, so I have to rib her a little bit. You know, her mother. <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> her mother. No pun intended. Yeah. Her mother grew up like with the crock pot rib, you know, yeah. where they just kind of like implode on themselves, you know, and they're sure. just like, uh, they fall off the bone, they implode off the bone. Um, and and the, the sauce is just essentially like uh, ketchup in my mind. So I, mm. I, I'm very much more of a North Carolinian style barbecue. I like the whole hog. I, I think that it shouldn't have sauce. And if you're going to do anything, it should just be apple cider vinegar, salt and crushed red pepper. That's, that's my, mm-hmm. my mantra when it comes to it. But um, for me, when I cook my ribs, I actually have a different word to use. So not fall off the bone, not gnaw off the bone. I like to use bite off the bone. And there's a, mm. there you go. you're not gnawing it. Uh, it's not just going to fall off and plop on your plate, but it, it takes just a bite and then it should pull clean from the rib. And and that's there really the okay. uh, the technique that I think a lot of people judge their ribs for, by. And there are days where, you know, I'm not at my best and I may not have enough time and they're a little more gnaw off the bone, uh, yeah. but I will never let them just implode off the bone in that sense. <laughs> so I think bite <laughs> off the bone is probably the, the the word that I would use most often. Excellent. Thank well, you for clarifying. Thank you for solving that for us because now we can we have something to go back to with our readers. Yeah, sure. Hey, Adam, do you want to ask Matt your fish question? All right, sure. Hey, Matt. Hey, hey. How are you? All right. So I love to order grilled fish when I'm out at a restaurant, but for whatever reason, I can't really figure out how to make it so it's either not you know a big black clump of char or just all dried out and gross. So uh, yeah. what do you recommend? Yeah, I mean, fish is a, a, a difficult thing to grill, um, especially for those that aren't actively, um, you know, utilizing their grills or are common with how to, to properly cook fish. I think a lot of folks just bake fish because it's the easiest method because you're not really touching it. You're allowing even heat to kind of convect around it. So um, exactly. I would tell people if you're, if you're worried about it in the beginning, you want to choose especially um, cuts like a salmon or a swordfish, um, even some grouper that's a little bit more firm texture, uh, that's gonna allow you uh, the best chance of success because it's gonna be more amenable to a a piece of steak or something along those lines. It's gonna stand up better for you on the grill. So um, set yourself up for success and, and start learning with those cuts that are a little more firm rather than delicate. Um, I, I think we haven't mentioned this, but like you should keep a clean grill. You know, after you cook, I like to leave the heat on to allow it to kind of cook off, and then I will brush it down at that time. Um, and a lot of times after that, I might you know coat the the grates in a little bit of oil or something along those lines. So you're building up um, you know kind of a non-stick surface. And a lot of grills these days come with cast iron grates that are already seasoned that allow you to do that. So mm-hmm. moving from just the fish itself, the next technique would be um, to kind of emulate what you're doing by baking fish. And, and again, David, going back to that cast iron technique is you're, mm-hmm. you're able to um, put the fish in a, in a cast iron pan or even a stainless pan in certain instances and, and still put that directly over the grates. And if you have a cast iron grill, 
uh, or a charcoal grill, excuse me, uh, you're still going to pick up a lot of that that smoke and char, especially as you cover uh, that that grill that's just going to be naturally permeating the fish and, and give you that result that you want. Even if you have a gas grill, the gas grill should be you know seasoned from other things that you've been cooking to where it will taste different, uh, even though it didn't actually get cooked exactly on the grates. And then I mm-hmm. think as you move forward, um, the ad- idea is to really let that Maillard reaction occur. A lot of people will put fish on the grill and they'll start poking and prodding at it. Um, and it hasn't had the chance to allow the natural proteins to kind of lift themselves up off the grill. So you want to make sure that you preheat the grill. Uh, fish is often cooked rather, rather hot um, mm-hmm. and over direct heat. So we want to make sure that we, we give the grill some time to cre- create that uh, conductive heat. And, and then, you know, make sure if you're using a whole fish, you've got a lot of skin on that. Make sure you use a little bit of cook, cooking oil. I recommend for that kind of a canola oil over an olive oil, just because of the mm-hmm. fact you've got a higher smoke point on it and, uh, right. and just set it on there and let it, let it do its thing. So, you know, we, we do a lot of fish recipes. Um, and the last thing I was going to mention is a fish basket. That's kind of a foolproof. So, uh, mm-hmm. it just requires mm-hmm. you to buy one other thing, but I do that a lot with whole fish to where I know I'm going to be kind of turning them several times and it's going to be contained in a basket. That way I can open it up and it's going to be a no-brainer. But um, probably my favorite recipe that we did in the book, uh, we've got redfish on the half shell, we've got trout, we've got all these different things yeah. that I grew up with. Um, but probably the piece of fish that changed my life, um, I have a business that's based in the south of France and um, there's a, a little place right there and um, just at maybe 20 kilometers uh, west of Nice where they, they actually cook the, the local fish. It's really a, a form of a durad, but they grill it very simply uh, directly over the coals and they finish it with just fennel seed. And, I, yeah. and there's something oh, about nice. it. It's Beautiful. like this licorice flavor with just a clean yeah. piece of fish that um, I think we ended up doing it with some pompano uh, in the book. And uh, that's just one of those things where you actually just take a, an ingredient that's much more common to like Italian and uh, you know more sausage style flavors that uh, was really just a game changer for me. And that's what I love about writing cookbooks is you take those little moments in your life where you've had a dish and then you kind of be you're able to put it into a recipe that's sort of your own. Of course, I always call it out in the head notes, but um, yeah, it's a fantastic method. And what do you think about grilling fish like salmon over cedar planks that are soaked? I mean, I think it's a great technique. Um, You know, a lot of people do that. That's more indirect style cooking because, of course, Mm -hmm. you want to soak that plank. Um, Right. And and we talk a little bit about this. So uh, a a two-zone fire, if if you want to really become a great grill master, you'll notice that people are always setting up uh, different hot heat points on the grill. So for mm-hmm. gas, it's really easy, right? Like I, if I have a two uh, burner g- gas grill or a four burner, I, I can set you know half the grill towards more of a medium high and the other half towards low. And then I think where a lot of people trip up in charcoal grilling is that you know once you get those coals going, you can't just turn a knob down to, to turn them off. I mean, <laughs> yeah. you, exactly. can, you can cut off the, the airflow to the charcoal, but that's gonna take five to 10 minutes to really make uh, a 20 to 30 degree uh, jump in temperature or reduction in temperature like you can get on gas. So I always recommend having two zones. So mm-hmm. if that's charcoal, because that's where a lot of people have trouble, we just pile the coals onto one side, right? And we light those there and that's gonna be our direct zone and then offset mm-hmm. in that sense, horizontally offset. So like a, um, a Weber kettle grill, right? I mean, one of the mm-hmm. most ca- classic mm-hmm. grills that's out there. You don't, you don't have a lot of vertical separation between the charcoal and the grill grate. So the way that you indirectly cook is that you horizontally offset from the heat source. So you're, you're going the opposite way. Now we see a lot of grills where you can actually change the, the, the depth and the height of the grill grate to where you can vertically offset the heat source. So right. whatever you're doing uh, for that particular uh, cut or something that you're looking for, like the cedar plank salmon, you just want to make mm-hmm. sure that you're allowing the, the cedar to kind of warm through and you're kind of convecting the heat around it. And you could actually cook that uh, really well in your oven as well. So uh, I'm a big fan of planking, as they call it. I think it was probably a little bit more popular uh, maybe 10 years ago, but it's still a way to, yeah. to impart really good cedar flavor for the right dishes that you want to have that on. Excellent. Well, Matt, we could keep on talking about grilling and smoking forever. Would you come back and talk more? Anytime, man. I have been uh, such a fan of you guys, David, and uh, followed your site for a long time. So it's really a pleasure to connect with you. And um, you guys are doing such fantastic work. And it's fun to move from from the blog and the web medium to the podcast medium. So um, anytime you can have me, it would be my pleasure. 
Excellent. Well, thank you so much. We appreciate you sharing your advice. Cheers, guys. Matt Moore is an entrepreneur, a chef, musician, host, pilot, and the quintessential Southern gentleman. He's the author of Serial Griller, as well as The South's Best Butts in a Southern Gentleman's Kitchen. His food writing has garnered critical acclaim from publications including the Wall Street Journal, Chicago Tribune, and the Washington Post. You can find him on his website at mattmore.com and on Instagram. His handle is at Matt R. Moore. Charcoal, check. Matches, check. Meat, double check. Renee, it's that time again. I'm yeah. dying to find out what's on the specials board. Can you tell me what's coming up this week on Leets? Here we go. We keep the outdoor grilling theme. Mm-hmm. We start with smoked spare ribs. You can do them either on the grill or the smoker. They come mm-hmm. with a Texas style barbecue sauce. Mm-hmm. A little nod to our guest, Mr. Moore. Yes, absolutely. And we also carry through to Jamaica with some jerk chicken, mm-hmm. again, on the grill. Mm-hmm. We tell you how to make roast potatoes on the grill so you don't have to do that thing where you're running in between kitchen and grill when you're making nice. dinner. Everything comes together in one place. And then we finish it up with a Memphis style barbecue mop sauce. Mm. Kind of mustardy, kind of tangy, kind of peppery. Goes on anything pork butt, chicken, burgers, you name it. Mm. I've always wanted to get my butt mopped. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> we are so not going there. <laughs> Oh, this podcast is produced by Over It Studios, and our producer is the sizzling hot, Adam Claremont. <laughs> you can reach Adam and Over It Studios at overitstudios.com. And remember to subscribe to Talking With My Mouthful wherever you download your favorite podcasts. And if you like what you hear and want to support us, please leave us a review and rating on iTunes. Ciao. Ciao.